This story is told in an old book, thousands of years old. Every word I'm about to tell you is true. Some of it will be hard to believe, but the truth is often stranger than fiction. In the beginning, before the first man was created, before the earth, the sun, the stars, even before light and time were created, there was God. He alone existed without beginning, but he was not lonely. Unlike finite man, God exists simultaneously as three persons in one. Each distinct person is co-equal and co-eternal, one in essence, nature, power, action, and will. He communed with himself in harmonious love. But God wanted to share his life. He wanted friends and neighbors. The Bible tells us God created numerous kinds of angelic beings to offer praise around his throne. But one, called Lucifer, led a third of them in rebellion. God cast them out of heaven, and Lucifer's name was changed to Satan. But this is not their story. This is the story of God working with mankind. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it came to pass that the earth was formless and void, and the Creator moved upon the face of the waters. Suddenly, God spoke into the darkness. Let there be light. It was not as many modern men suppose. The Creator did not make use of evolution. He created all things by simply speaking them into existence. In six 24-hour days, God made plants and animals to populate the earth. On the sixth day, with the evil ones watching, God formed a new creature from the dust of the ground. God breathed his own life into the body of clay, and the man became a living soul. He was made in the image of God, higher than the animals. God called the new creature man and gave him the name Adam. Abraham's journey took him down into the land of Canaan, where Ham's son settled. Today it is called Palestine. There God spoke to him. Abraham, walk through this land from one end to the other. I'm going to give all this land of Canaan to your future children. I will make you have so many children that they cannot be counted. They will multiply like the dust of the earth. Sarah, God told me that you are going to have children after all these years. You know that I have never been able to have a child, and now I am past childbearing age. How can I have children? God said you would. As Abraham traveled through the land, occasionally he stopped and offered a blood sacrifice to God. Like Abel, he made the sacrifice by faith, knowing that he was a sinner, deserving of death. The sacrifice of a lamb could not take away his sin, but when God saw Abraham's faith, God covered Abraham's sin. Ten years later, Abraham, ten years ago, you said God told you that I would bear your child. I am now seventy-five, and you are eighty-five. We grow older, but still no child. Soon, you'll be too old to produce a child. Are you sure you heard from God? I know it was God who spoke to me, but I do not understand why he waits so long. He said I would be the father of a great nation, but all I have is an old body, an old wife that cannot have children, and a great big flock of sheep. Fear not, Abraham. I am your protection and your great reward. What reward will you give me, since I have no child? 
you and Sarah will have a child. Come, Abraham, look at the stars and see if you can count them. Like the stars, your children will be so many that they cannot be counted. I believe it will come to pass, as you say. Since you believe me, I'm going to count your faith as if it were righteousness. Know of a certainty that your children will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. After they have suffered as slaves for 400 years, I will punish that nation, and your children will leave there with great wealth. Then they will come back here and inhabit this land. He was 13, and Abraham was 99. God spoke to him again. Abraham, I am the Almighty God. Do all that I tell you and sin not. As I told you before, I will multiply your children, and you will be the father of many nations. I will establish my covenant with you, and then with your children after you. I will give to your children the land of Canaan as a possession forever. Sarah will conceive and have the child as I promised, the one who is to be the head of many nations, <laughs> How can that be? I am now 99 years old and Sarah is 89. My body is as good as dead. We cannot have children. Please, let Ishmael be the promised child. No. As I said from the beginning, you and Sarah will have a child of your own, from your own bodies. The promise of blessing will be passed on through him, not Ishmael. In one year, Sarah will give birth to a male child. Is it possible? Yes. The God who created the human body can surely take two old dead bodies and make them fertile again. Sure, God can do it. He will be the father of a great nation. Yes, when God told us I would bear a child, it made me laugh. Who would have believed that in my old age, I would be nursing my very own child? God kept his promise. He always does. Ishmael, Abraham's son by Hagar, was now 14 years old, and he hated the new baby. The little fool mocks me. I will not have that Egyptian in the same house with my Isaac. Cast out the servant woman and her son. They will not receive any inheritance with Isaac, the child of promise. God spoke to Abraham and said, Sarah is right. Send Hagar and Ishmael away. Ishmael will not be the heir with Isaac. But don't let it grieve you. I will take care of them. And because Ishmael is your son, I will make a great nation come from him also. But the promised deliverer, the one who will defeat Satan, will come through Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael grew up to become the father of all the Arabic people, while Isaac grew up to become the head of all the Jewish people. Arabs and Jews are half-brothers. Abraham loved his son Isaac, and they became inseparable. You're a miracle child. Will you deliver the world from sin? Abraham, I want you to take your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering to me. God, how could you ask me to do such a thing? This is not like you. The heathen offer human sacrifices. You said you would make a great nation from my son Isaac. If I kill him, your promise will not come to pass. But you are God. I do not understand, but I will obey you. It is a three-day journey, so we will be gone about a week. Do take care. I will pray for my two men. Three days later... Father, there is the mountain. We will be there before nightfall. 
Yes, we will go and worship and return again. Father, we brought the wood, and you have built the altar, but where is the sacrifice? Isaac, you remember how I told you of God speaking to me and causing your mother and me to have a child in our old age? Well, he spoke to me again. This time, he said I am to offer you as a burnt offering. Me, Father? Are you sure? Didn't God tell you that I was to be the heir, head of a great nation, that my children would be as many as the stars of the heaven? If I die now, what of God's promise? I have learned that what God promises he is able to perform. If he says you will be the father of a great nation, then you will, even if you die. But how could it be if I am dead? I don't know unless he raises you from the dead. Father, we must obey God, no matter what. Though Abraham knew that he was obeying God, it must have made his heart sad and his hands tremble as he followed the normal procedures of offering a burnt offering. He tied his son's hands and feet and laid him on the altar. The next step was to plunge the knife into his throat. With a prayer of faith to God, Abraham lifted the knife. As he was about to plunge downward, suddenly he heard a voice from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, don't harm the child. Now I know that you trust me, since you were willing to obey, even to the point of giving me your only son. When Abraham looked up, he saw a ram caught in a thicket. Father, look! God provided a ram to take my place! Abraham, because you have done this thing and not withholding your only son, I will bless you and multiply your children as the stars of heaven. And your children shall take this land and destroy your enemies. Also, through one of your children, yet to be born, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Father, he is a merciful God, just like you said. Moses found a new life among the Midianites. He learned the ways of the wilderness, married, and became a shepherd. Forty years passed, and Egypt became a distant memory. Moses had given up hope of ever seeing his people again. That is indeed strange. How did that bush catch on fire? And why does it not burn up? It just keeps on burning and burning. Moses, take your shoes off. You are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have seen the suffering and heard the prayers of my people in Egypt. It is time to deliver them from their oppression and bring them back into the land I promised their fathers. I will send you to Pharaoh and you will bring my people out of their bondage. You will tell him to let my people go and he will refuse. Then I will show my power to Egypt. After that he will let them go. But they will not believe that you have sent me. They will just laugh. Throw your staff on the ground. What? My staff? It has become a deadly serpent. Pick up the serpent by the tail. It has turned back into my rod. Go to Egypt. I will teach you what to say and tell you what to do. Your brother Aaron will be your assistant. You are going back to Egypt? But what about all those who seek to kill you? It has been 40 years. All who know anything of my past are dead. No one will recognize me. How long will you be gone? Until Pharaoh lets God's people go. Who is this God that I should obey him? That's ridiculous. I am not going to let my slaves take a three-day trip into the wilderness. I have heard how you are stirring up my people 
causing them to stop working. And now they want to take a three-day trip to worship a god I don't even know. I will see to it that they have more work to do. From now on, they will have to provide their own straw for making bricks. <laughs> now get out of my sight and go back where you came from. Can you believe the audacity? That was funny. They march in here like they were the voice of God. You're telling us that all you accomplished was to double our workload? Some kind of deliverance. And do you think God sent you? Who does he think he is? Some kind of a fanatic. Jehovah, since I have come speaking in your name, things have gotten much worse. Why do you send me here? I am Jehovah, the God of your fathers, and I have seen the suffering and have heard the cries of my people, Israel. It is time to fulfill my promise to Abraham and lead this people to the land of Canaan. You, Moses, will lead them. But I cannot speak well. Pharaoh will not listen to me. Aaron will do the talking. You just listen to me and tell him what to say. At first, Pharaoh will not listen to you, but I will show him greater signs until the Egyptians know that I am the only true God. God has spoken to Moses. God says, I will send swarms of flies upon Egypt. Your houses shall be filled with flies. But this time, I will make a difference between the Egyptians and the Hebrews. There shall be no flies among my people. By this, everyone shall know I am the God of the whole earth. Daddy, why can't our priests stop this man? Where is their power? I don't know anything about religion. I just mind my own business. It is just as he said. There are no flies among the Hebrews. This must be the work of their God. Go find Moses. Go then and sacrifice to your God, but do not leave the land of Egypt. We must go at least three days' journey. I said you can go, but you cannot go very far. Now talk to your God and ask him to take away these stinking flies. There is not one fly left alive in all of Egypt. Now that is a miracle. Shut up! You sound as if you are beginning to believe the babbler. Again, Pharaoh hardened his heart and refused to let the people go. God sent another plague on Egypt. All of their cows, sheep, oxen, horses and camels developed runny sores and died. But the animals of the Hebrews did not catch the disease. Our animals are all dead, and yours are healthy. How do you explain that? Moses says it is the God of our fathers come to deliver us from your cruel bondage. But I am a simple man. I do not know about such things. Our priests are offering sacrifices to our gods. Our sacred bull will be angry and put a stop to this. Tell Pharaoh that it is too late. All our sacred bulls have died. The people will be angry when they learn that our gods could not protect themselves from this phantom god of the Hebrews. Where are the gods of the Egyptians? Have they no power? But Pharaoh hardened his heart. Again God spoke to Moses and told him to sprinkle ashes over the city and the Egyptians would be covered with boils. God says, because you will not let my people go, I will set terrible boils to cover you and all your animals. Oh no, not again! Rise up early and stand before Pharaoh and say, the God of the Hebrews says, let my people go. For the next plague will be far worse. It will bring destruction that will kill many of your people. By this you shall know that there is no God like me. You don't realize it, but I am the one who made you be Pharaoh. You see, 
I knew you would harden your heart and refuse to let my people go. Your stubbornness gives me the opportunity to manifest my power and bring judgment on Egypt for their cruel treatment of my people. You promote your own interest and resist doing my will. So tomorrow at this time, I will send a rain of ice and fire like the earth has never seen before. I tell you so you can warn everyone to put himself or any animals he may have indoors, for all that are outside will die. Be it as Jehovah has said. Those who did not regard the warning and were caught outdoors died. How could such a thing happen? Fire and ice mixed. Mighty God Seth, save us! Ah! Father, how does that man know this? Do this. Is his God more powerful than Seth, Lord of Chaos, and Storms? He claims there is only one God, and that these Hebrews are his children. But no one has ever seen his God, not even the Hebrews. His God, which he claims is just a spirit, is trying to convince Pharaoh to let them into the wilderness to worship. Almighty Seth, Lord of Chaos and Storms, we beg of you, put a stop to these terrible storms. Surely you are greater than this unseen God of Moses. It doesn't come near us, just the Egyptians. Daddy, I'm afraid. Will the fire and ice fall on us too? No, child. Jehovah is punishing the Egyptians for not obeying him. He is showing them that their god of storms, Seth, is powerless to help them. It is so horrible. I have sinned against Jehovah. The god of Hebrews is righteous, and my people are wicked. Ask Jehovah to stop the fire and ice, and I will let your people leave immediately. As soon as I am out of the city, I will lift my hands to heaven, and the plague will cease. By this, you will know that the earth belongs to Jehovah, but you will not keep your word. You do not yet fear God. When Pharaoh saw that the storm was past, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. He did not let the people go. God sent yet another plague. Locusts came and ate every green thing that the storm had not destroyed. Then the locusts chewed their way into the houses. Mama! Mama! <gasps> Take that! Jeff, God of vegetation, do you not see what this God of the Hebrews does to our crops? Osiris! Show yourself strong this day! Pharaoh called Moses and promised to let the people go. But when God took away the locusts, Pharaoh again hardened his heart and refused to give up his slaves. Then God caused a thick darkness to descend over Egypt. For three days it was blacker than a cloudy night. But in the Hebrew homes there was no darkness. I could have had you killed before now, but that would prove that our gods had no power against yours. Get out of my sight. I will never see your face again, for in that day you will die. You have spoken the truth for once. We will never see each other again. Ra, great god of the sun, hear us. For three days you have hidden yourself. Can you not defeat this god of the Hebrews? This is it. One final plague and Pharaoh will be glad to see us leave Egypt. Tonight at midnight, the destroyer will pass through the land of Egypt. The firstborn male child in every family will die. God will punish sin this night. But what of our firstborn? Will they also die? God has provided salvation for all who believe, even the Egyptians. 
Go now and take a young male lamb or goat. Kill it this evening and place the blood of the lamb on either side and over the door. Jehovah says, as I pass through the land tonight, slaying all the firstborn males, when I see the blood on the outside of your doors, I will pass over that house, and the firstborn will not die. Remain in your house tonight and eat the lamb that you slay. Tomorrow, go to your Egyptian masters and borrow their valuables, gold, jewels, and silver. God has touched their hearts. They will give freely and abundantly. Pack your things and be ready to leave tomorrow morning. You will not be coming back here again. It is goodbye to Egypt forever. This will be the beginning of time for you, your first day. Father, that's the only name. Couldn't we just use red paint or something? Son, God said kill a lamb and put its blood on the doorpost. We must do exactly as he says. You have seen how he judges those who do not obey him. This lamb is to save you from death. Then this lamb has died for me? And for me also, for I too am a firstborn son. Mama, why is Daddy painting our door with blood? Jehovah said, when I see the blood on your doors, I will know that you believe me and I will not kill anyone inside the house. Why have you not killed the lamb and placed blood on your door? Ha! Huh. You believe all that superstitious stuff? How is a little blood on a doorpost going to stop death from coming? My son is not scared. Are you, Joakim? Huh, of course not. You think I'm a sissy? Religion is for weaklings. A good God wouldn't kill people for just failing to put a little blood on their door. What about the people who haven't heard? Father, why is this night different from all others? Because tonight God will send his destroyer to kill all firstborn males who do not believe him. But when he sees the blood, he will pass over that home. This is the beginning of days to us. Every year at this time we will celebrate this Passover and remember that God delivered us from the hand of Pharaoh. Oh, Father, listen to the screams. The destroyer must be here. Do not be afraid. We have obeyed God. The blood is on the doorpost. We are eating the lamb. My son is dead! Oh, God, do something! Call Moses! I am sorry, but it is too late. You were warned, but you refused to believe. I'm afraid that many have died this night. Our son is dead! Hurry, bring Moses here immediately. Oh. What the? He is the firstborn of his family. Pharaoh again called for Moses. But Pharaoh did not look at Moses' face. I have sinned. Please leave Egypt and take all the Hebrews with you. Your God, Jehovah, is more than I can bear. Bless me before you go. Just as God had promised their fathers, after 400 years, they were leaving Egypt. The Egyptians gave the Hebrews gold and jewels and food, anything they wanted and could carry. It was a joyous occasion for the Hebrew children, the first day of a new nation. 600,000 men, with the women and children, left Egypt to travel to the Promised Land. God led them during the day with a cloud, which gave them shade, and during the night with a pillar of fire, which gave them light. <laughs> 